there is no atom. So really, by, by definition, there is no conflict with science because they fully accept science. And, and for example, the Bible stories of creation and the Noah's flood, they'll say those are so-called godly myths. Not myths that they're just made up fanciful stories, but they're myths in that they're not literally true. They're just there to teach a theological truth. But the young earth and old earth creationists and even the Roman Catholics believe that there was a literal worldwide flood that only eight humans were saved from and we all descended from that. That for the Catholics that goes to their doctrine of baptism where they, they say just as Noah was saved through water, this is you know, a prefig prefiguring about how we are saved. Um, so these evolutionary creationists, they're my biggest um, challenge really because they accept modern science now. So they, they don't have a conflict with science, but now we start to get into philosophy because what happens is by them accepting science, they create a whole new problem of what they call theodicy, the problem of evil. Because traditionally you blame the problem of evil on Adam and Eve, now there's no Adam and Eve to blame this on. So what is theodicy, this problem of evil, so much? Well, the idea basically boils down to God is all-loving and all-powerful, but evolution is very red and what they say, red in tooth and claw. Uh, a poetic way to put that is that the teeth and the claws of the cheetah sculpted the speed of the gazelle. There's this continual arms race in evolution, and this is how we created such fabulous beings that we have today. And uh, we might say that this pain and suffering is over the top. It's not just a little bit of you know, pain, pain and suffering, but the global scales we see this on. For example, scientists say that 99% of all species that ever lived are now extinct. And consider the dinosaurs lived for millions of years. Why, why was, what was the point of all that? Um, there was, and remember, there was, um, there was no ark, no worldwide flood. Um, so. You know, they might explain that, well, a lot of these animals uh, died in the flood and everything, but, you know, there's a recent earth. But no, I mean, when you consider the earth as millions of years of old, you know, the dinosaurs ruled for millions of years. There's a lot of history. You know, America is only 200 years old, and we're talking about living creatures, you know, dying and living for millions of years. Also, there's this idea that some atheists have even put forward this idea that maybe there's this uh, idea of the slaughter of the innocents. When you look at all the children that die worldwide, uh, it's very high, um, and some people have made studies on this. I haven't seen all the documentation, but I mean, you could say 50% or something really super high. We don't really see it so much in America because of our standard of living. But th like, um, there's one Christian ministry that's called Compassion. You know, they say there's like 30,000 kids that die every day just from preventable things like starvation and diarrhea and things like that. Well. You know, again, we can't blame this on Adam and Eve. That's usually the typical idea is that we inherited the sin and everything. And, but with this position, um, there's no conflict with science. But this, the, this, this philosophy is really starting to have a big problem. Then also you got the, these birth defects. I mean, you know, Siamese twins. Um, you know, to me it's really sad to see. I mean, can you imagine if a, a couple you know, they, if they had Siamese twins, they gave birth, or some person had two heads or something like that. It's really sad. I mean. Why, why is God doing this? You know, and again, people might, you know, Christians usually try to blame this on Adam and Eve's sin and we inherited the sin, but in this position, there is no sin. So again, if you do accept Adam and Eve, then you, you got the obvious conflict with science. There is no first humans. But if you don't, then you have these other philosophical problems, even though you don't have a direct problem with science. So now I'll talk about neuroscience a little bit, what that has brought us into mind. Well, you know, when science first started out, they actually had this concept called vitalism, and they thought there was some kind of living force in the cells of biology. And that, this was the scientists, the scientists believe this, and now this is totally gone. Nobody believes in vitalism anymore. We just have biochemical processes, and there is no life force or anything like that. That's some kind of spiritual sense. There used to be this, this idea of a homunculus. There's this little man in our head. You know, he's the one. That, that's the real me, you know, that's, that's what makes all the decisions and things, but, you know, we're, dis we're discovering that that's not the way it is either. I'll give you a quote from, uh, this book is called Neuroscience for Dummies. Um, it doesn't mean it's written by a dummy, it's mean it's trying to explain it simply. Uh, this one guy named Dr. Frank Amthor, he's a professor at University of Alabama. Uh, this one section in the book is called 10 Amazing Facts About the Brain. And so what he says is the brain doesn't have a consciousness neuron and no particular brain area by itself serves as a seat of consciousness. 
No place in the brain receives the results of all the neural processing in the rest of the brain, so there's no top in the neural hierarchy, and nothing in the brain looks at images formed in other parts of the brain. So we might think like, oh, our brain has different parts, and they all do different functions, and there's some kind of master controller over it all, and that's me, that's what I am. But he's saying there is no master controller of the brain. There's a lot of parallel processing and different functioning going on, and it all comes together to, to create our thinking processes. There's a, just some science on this. There's, um, some people have these epilepsy seizures, and what happens is one, one part of the brain hemisphere will, will link into the other one, cause some storms, and go into the other one and cause some more storms, and it brings the people into a seizure. So they have this major fiber network between the two that they snip in surgeries, and they've noticed that there's not really too much of an implication for that for the person. But going a little further, they've done some experiments where, for example, uh, they could show a person uh, from their left field of vision, their left eye, they can show them a picture of something. Now that picture is processed by the right side of their brain. And they find out that the patient can't really talk about it. You know, like it sounds like he doesn't know, like it doesn't know about it. Because that's the other part of the brain that processes that speech and thing, that kind of stuff. But they can actually point to it with their left hand because it's also controlled by the right hem hemisphere. So it's kind of interesting how, you know, at first on the surface it looks like there's nothing different about this person with this cut fiber uh, connection, but you know, they can see some how the brain is working here. So that kind of shows again that there's no overall you that's in, in control of everything. Um, there's also been neurological studies lately where they have somebody push the button and, they, and then they find out that this person actually pushes the button before they actually think they made the decision. And so it shows that there's a lot of subconscious processing going on and um, the person later on thinks that they made this conscious decision when there's some subconscious um, calculations going on and actually making a decision before that. And the, one way they've demonstrated that is that they've shown that beyond chance that they can predict what the person's going to do before the person looks like he decides what he's going to do based on this, um, the neural uh, monitoring they've done. Okay, so p part of all this, um, the result of this is that there's really no you to survive death because we know that the brain, basically our mind, just evolves from the brain. So we need to, we need to accept that. Uh, the first stage, you know, there's, these, there's this one common way of looking at it where, you know, there's, uh, when you have bad news, there's denial, then anger, um, then negotiation, depression, and acceptance. Well, I think a lot of the, the religions are into denial yet because they still haven't grasped us, that, grasped that we are um, finite beings. Thank you. So there's a whole bunch of other problems, too, with thinking that the uh, soul is given at conception. For example, you know, there's a high rate of pregnancies and in miscarriage, like maybe even 70%. People don't even know about that. Um, even the women don't even know they're pregnant and they miscarriage sometimes. Uh, identical twins, basically, um, what happens there is that one egg is fertilized and it's developing, and at some time after it's di divided a few times, it actually goes into two separate things. And so, like, well, if they each have a soul, I mean, there is two souls given at conception, because if, if the soul's at conception, you have a big problem there. So, um, basically, in summary, I just want to say that I want to encourage people to seek the truth, to be a truth seeker, um, to seek the truth with reckless abandon. I did that as a Christian, and that's why I left the faith, really, the way I see it. Um, some people might say, that's strange to be a Christian. How could you put devotion to truth above God? Well, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. So if it's true, the more you seek the truth, the more it will lead you to God. Um, the other thing, too, is if God really did make you with the brain, he should be proud of you to use it to its fullest extent, just as we're proud of our kids when they bring home good grades. So I'll leave it with that. And I have a lot more evidence to bring up if people want to talk some more about some other evidences. So I'll leave it with that. Thank you. Well, there's a handout over there with the agenda. Can you look at that? Yeah, because there's going to be an extensive time for Q&A later, and that will show you where we're at. We will have a full hour for Q&A after this is all said and done. So there we go. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Right. And Dr. Rask, would you like to present your rebuttal? You have yeah. Uh, thank you, Bernie Taylor, for inviting me to this. My name is Bart Rask. I found out from these discussions in the Oregon newspaper. I'm a Christian, an orthopedic surgeon in Hillsboro, I have a degree in microbiology, and am a reviewer for the American Journal of Sports Medicine, in which I evaluate the validity of scientific papers from around the world. 
Today, I review the information presented about origin science as I would a paper submitted to a scientific journal. And just uh, a lot of my information are from these three books, Karl Popper's Conjections and Refutations, uh, Kopi's Introduction to Logic, and Plausibility Theory, The Logic of Science by E.T. James. I'm going to talk about logic, and those are my references. Uh, faith versus science. The distinguishing feature between faith and science is that science must meet certain criteria described by Newton as being based upon gathering empirical and measurable evidence subject to specific principles of reasoning. And then philosopher Karl Popper adds, confirming evidence should not count except when it is a result of a genuine test of the theory. If the theory does not meet these criteria, it's called speculation or faith. I will show how the alleged science that destroys Christianity or origin science universally deviates from standard scientific method. Part of scientific methodology is logic used to make conclusions from observations. Since theories about origins are not based on direct observations, they rely on indirect evidence or clues for support, which must be logically interpreted. The most basic way of arriving at a logical conclusion is deductive reasoning. For example, if A is raining is true, then B it is wet is true. And in fact, it is raining, therefore it is wet is true. The antecedent A is used to affirm the consequent B. That the statements are organized differently, an illogical and potentially false conclusion can be made called the fallacy of affirming the consequent. If it is raining, then it is wet. But being wet does not mean it's raining. There can be other reasons for being wet, such as melted snow. This is basic logic 101. Notice the difference between logical deductive reasoning on the left and the illogical fallacy of affirming the consequent. In the fallacy, B affirms the antecedent A instead of vice versa. The fallacy of affirming the consequent is the, one, is the most common logical error in origin science. A variation of the fallacy of affirming the consequent is the potentially logical plausibility or inductive reason. If the consequent it is wet is affirmed, the antecedent it is raining is not true but could be plausible depending upon other information. But the plausibility is not decided by the information in the statements. The conclusion it is raining would be plausible if you, for, because of other information, such as if you actually see it raining, or if it's getting wetter on both the lawn and the pavement instead of the lawn only. Neuroscience. I'll make this brief. The soul is a faith-based supernatural phenomenon and not subject to natural laws. Arguments claiming that, as a scientific, that there is scientific evidence for the soul is a straw man argument, and the discussion is absurd. I'm not going to talk anymore about that. Cosmology. How do scientists know the universe is 13 billion years old? I checked NASA's website and it cites the use of the Wilkinson Microwave Anistropy Probe. It measures differences in temperature across the sky from cosmic microwave background radiation. It's based on the Big Bang model, which assumes that when the universe was young, it was small and hot, and as it expanded to create the stars and planets, it cooled and a radiation temperature gradient developed, which is, which is measured by the probe. There are problems with WMAP dating because it's based on only two observations, a temperature gradient and moving celestial bodies. And from these two observations, they believe the Big Bang Theory to be supported, thus legitimizing age measurements. But the assumption that the Big Bang Theory is supported is illogical. You can see the reasoning fits perfectly into the fallacy of affirming the consequent. Just because something is moving does not mean it's expanding. Another problem with WMAP is calibration. NASA's website says it's calibrated based on the composition of matter and energy density in the universe and Einstein's theory of relativity. The problem is that since the units in its measuring the universe is in years, it must be calibrated with the gold standard for the year, which is the time it takes for the Earth to rotate around the sun. Gold standards are absolutely necessary to check the accuracy for any measuring device, which is a standard in all other science except origin science. Otherwise, no one has no idea what you're measuring. Weight scales use a liter of water for the kilogram. The MRI in my field, when, when it was validated, used cadavers and surgical findings for its validation. For WMAP, there is no calibration against the gold standard. All it measures is temperature. And the conversion from temperature to years is based on a fallacy. Now, the flood is a faith-based phenomenon. Uh, it's based on the faith of the written documentation and the Bible is true, just as we rely on written documentation of any historical documents, such as the life of Abraham Lincoln. 
got any evidence for the flood, if you can have a supernatural making of the flood, you can also have a supernatural correction of the flood. This is another absurd case of imposing natural criteria on faith-based supernatural phenomena. Also, regarding the flood, I did the math. If there are eight people, if each couple has six kids, I have six kids, 40 years per generation, you can get a billion people after 17 generations or in 680 years. So mathematically, it's plausible. Geology. How do scientists know the Earth is four and a half billion years old? A common geologic clock is uranium decay. Uranium-238 undergoes a series of alpha and beta uh, particle decays to lead-206 with a presumed half-life of about four and a half billion years. The age of a rock or fossil sample is determined by measuring the ratio of uranium to lead and knowing the half-life of uranium decay. There are three problems with geologic clock clocks. One, there's no problem with the gold standard. And there is the illogical assumption, since there is since one source of lead is uranium decay, then that is the only source. And the formula to determine the half-life of uranium is unconfirmed. The half-life of radioisotopes, such as uranium-238, is assumed to follow a logarithmic curve. The y-axis could be counts per minute, and the x-axis is time. The half-life is the time it takes for half the elements in the sample to decay. But do all decay curves follow a predictable logarithmic pattern? Can you get an accurate half-life without measuring, without actually measuring the decay curve? Protactinium has a half-life of 71 and a half seconds, with a measured decay pattern that, that is almost more linear than the predicted logarithmic pattern. Iodine-128 has a directly measured half-life of 25 minutes. Argon-37, 34 days. Sulfur-35, 86 days. Here are three empirically directly measured decay curves, each of which used a different formula to calculate the half-life. To find out how the half-life of uranium is determined, I had to go way back to the 1930s. Using enriched uranium, nine five-minute intervals were counted, yielding an average of 62 counts per minute. The other variable was the number of atoms in one gram of sample. The half-life of about four and a half billion years was calculated using the formula shown. The problem with the formula for uranium half-life is it's not verified. Not only does the theoretical formula differ from those empirically determined, but even the empirically determined formulas differ from each other. This indicates decay curves are unpredictable and do not necessarily follow a simple logarithmic pattern. Further, it is absurd to use only one measurement to generate an entire curve. With an enriched sam sample, you would generate the top point at time zero, but how do you know what the rate will be at one year, let alone six million years? How do you know these decay patterns will, uh, uh, uranium will, how do you know which of these decay patterns uranium will take from this one measured point at time zero? Question. Many radioisotopes, such as potassium argon dating and uranium strontium dating, have their dates matched with those of uranium. Wouldn't that confirm their accuracy? Answer, no. Since they all use the sum, same unverified half-life formulas, their test results are mathematically kept in sync. If two radioisotopes ages coincide, coincide, it more likely means the samples were in the same, were in the, 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 the isotopes were in the sample the same amount of time. But how much time is determined by the unverified formula? Another question. Does it using large number of atom, atoms in the calculation increase the accuracy and make up for the short measurement time? Answer, no. It's still just one measured point. You're just plugging a larger number into the same unverified formula. All this does is give you a, hardy, a higher starting point on the y-axis. It doesn't give you more points on the curve. Another question, aren't decay rates predictable? Well, yes, decay rates are predictable, but not the decay curve. Decay rate, measuring counts per second, is analogous to velocity. The decay curve is like acceleration or deceleration. Individual atoms decay randomly, but by the law of large numbers, large numbers of, decay, of uh, atoms decay at a predictable rate. For example, in one study, they had five one-gram gram samples of enriched uranium-234 and all decayed at about the same rate of 2.4 times 10 to the 8 counts per second. What is not predictable are future decay rates, nor rates of different sample sizes. For example, on the graph, uh, at zero seconds, you could have 100 counts per second but you can't predict what the rate would be at 60 seconds or longer. 
the decay curve, analogous to deceleration or acceleration, is the change in rate of decay with time, measured in counts per second per minute, depending on how fast it decays. Empirical evidence shows that the, the curves are not predictable, and I just showed you four examples. The curve reflects an ever-decreasing number of radioisotopes, not the constant number, which decay at predictable rates. The unpredictable, unpredictability perhaps may be due to the accumulation of non-radioactive isotopes. If there's an unpredictable curve, there's an unpredictable half-life formula. Evolution. Evolution is a theory that all species were derived from a common ancestor by random mutation of uh, DNA or RNA and natural selection. I have my own term I call physiologically different species, which are those species whose sperm and eggs cannot combine to form viable hybrid, hybrids or have physiologic symptoms of different complexities, such as a flagella with a different number of proteins. Since wolf and dog can mate, they are physiologically the same, even though taxonomically they are classified as different species. Man and monkey have no physical capability of mating, so I would call them physiologically different. I came up with this definition because in my research this seems to define the empiric limits of evolution. Macroevolution, or evolution, is the creation of physiologic different species by random mutation and natural selection. Microevolution and modifications that don't create physiologic different species. The theory of evolution is entirely based on conclusions illogically derived from observations, making it a pseudoscience. In my research, I found there are generally two types of studies which erroneously are cited as evolu evidence for evolution. One is microevolution, and the other are just simply descriptions of comparative biology. Oh, shoot. Oh, okay. Um, there are So a typical microevolution study is one in which E. coli was grown for 20,000 generations and obtained the ability to metabolize citrate, which it does not normally do. This was claimed to be a demonstration of real-time evolution. It is not known exactly what changed, but typically changes in carbon metabolism involve a small change in one enzyme, not an increase in biochemical complexity, classifying it as just microevolution. Assuming you can extrapolate this to macroevolution is not supported by empirical evidence, and commits the logical error of the fallacy of the slippery slope. The other type of evidence used to support evolution are studies in comparative biology. Examples include the fossil record, pseudogenes, and endogenous retroviruses. If you carefully read these studies, you find these are just simply static comparisons of features among different species. The studies do not actually demonstrate any evolution, nor random mutation natural selection. The evolution is only assumed. For example, for the vitamin C gene, which has 12 exons or 12 parts in the rat, it was noticed that in the guinea pig it has 10 of these parts, but all are somewhat different from the rat. In the primate, there are only five of these parts, and all are a little bit more different from the rat. A conclusions that this observation represents scientific evidence for evolution are illogical. Now, uh, pseudogenes are genes that uh, presumably have no function, and they're believed to have been inherited from a common ancestor, and since they have no function, um, it's believed that there would be no other reason for descendants of that common ancestor to have it other than evolution. Uh, rat, makes, rat doesn't need vitamin C, humans do, and it's presumed that uh, these non-functioning stretches of DNA are remnants of uh, mutated uh, vitamin C gene. Now, the reason these comparative biology studies do not support evolution is because, as Karl Popper says, confirming evidence should not count except when it is a result of a genuine test of the theory. Evolutionists forget that the essence of evolution is random mutation and natural selection, which is not demonstrated in these studies. One cannot make claims about evolution by only showing a hypothesized result. You must show the process of random mutation and natural selection. There are common phrases evolutionists use to make arguments seem sound, but actually commit the fallacy of affirming the consequent. There is the phrase, evolution predicts pseudogenes or other evidence, and the evidence fits the evolution model. Remember basic logic 101. If the sun revolves around the earth, that's right, I said if the sun revolves around the earth, you would predict the sun to rise in the east and set in the west, and, this, and indeed the sun does rise in the east and set in the west. Therefore, the sun revolves around the earth. 
Likewise, if the evolution model is true, then you would predict pseudogenes in the fossil record. And indeed, there are pseudogenes in the fossil record. Therefore, evolution is true. Concluding pseudogenes, or the fossil record as evidence for evolution, is, has the same validity as concluding that since the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, then the sun must revolve around the earth. A theory can predict evidence and be wrong. Other arguments. What else could it be if not evolution? Or evolution is the most plausible and only scientific conclusion to explain observations. These arguments attempt to fit into plausibility reasoning, that is, Pseudogenes are true, therefore evolution becomes more plausible. But the plausibility of the conclusion, remember, depends upon other information, not the information in the statements. Otherwise, you'd commit the fallacy of affirmative consequent. But what is this other information that makes evolution a plausible conclusion? This brings us to the circle of illogic. Comparative biology studies such as pseudogenes and fossils alone don't support evolution. But evolution would be plausible depending upon other information. The other evidence cited is microevolution, but these studies only show small changes. Their extrapolation to macroevolution is justified by citing comparative biology, which again is justified by microevolution, and the cycle continues. Notice there is no ultimate basis for evolution's plausibility. Not only is there the absence of evidence for evolution's plausibility, there is evidence suggesting evolution as an implausible explanation for pseudogenes, fossils, and other comparative biology uh, observations. Actual empiric evidence shows that only species that can mate have a common ancestor. Since man, other primates, and guinea pigs can't mate with each other, common ancestry is therefore implausible. Another argument, evolution is the simplest explanation for comparative biology. Well, actually it isn't. Evolution is not the simplest explanation because it requires the unsupported assumptions of relationship by random mutation natural selection. A simpler explanation for pseudogenes, for example, is simply this. Since genotype contributes to phenotype, since genotype contributes to phenotype, more similar species will have more similar genes. Just because we don't know the functions of some pseudogenes does not mean they have no function. Regarding the fossil record, I have a simple explanation for it, and that is that there existed creatures a long time ago that are now extinct. That's all you can rationally conclude. In summary, the alleged science against Christianity is not real science. The theories are based on unsupported assumptions with no empiric evidence. The evidence does not represent a true test of theories. Cosmologic and geologic clocks are based on contrived models, formulas, and no gold standards. And conclusions from observations are universally illogical. Scientists' desire for alternative answers to origin questions trumps the desire to uphold standard scientific method. And Finally, if there is science that destroys Christianity, no one has found it. That's all. All right, my thanks to you both. And now we will have 10 minutes for Bernie and Bart to cross-examine one another. Gentlemen, it is yours. 10 minutes. Okay, and before you start, just um, have a little bit more ground rules. So the way I think, that if we all agree, the way I like to do this is, I have five minutes, and I'm in the driver's seat, so instead of asking a question and having a long sermon as an answer, I'm able to interject and direct the conversation, and then when it's Bart's turn, he'll have a chance to direct the conversation, correct? Sounds good to me. You agree with that? Okay. Okay, so I think um, this is something I want to see if you can admit. Um, my, so my, my presentation here is that basically modern science has a conflict with Christian theology, um, would you agree with me that Christian theology cannot survive if modern science is true? Because I think that you're, you have a beef with modern science. You think modern science is wrong. Is that correct? No. I think the interpretation of modern science is wrong. Okay, so do you believe there is a thing called scientific consen consensus? Yes. Okay. So do you think that there is a scientific consensus on origins of humans, for example? Yes. And would you say that's at odds with um, Christian theology? Yes. So uh, would you agree with me then that if you accept modern science or the scientific consensus, then you cannot maintain that theology? Uh, the, uh, your, your premise is that the scientific consensus is true. No, I'm saying if it was true. If it were true, It, it yes. could be wrong, but I'm saying if it was true, right. 
I, then that's right. If the scientific consensus were true, that would put some holes in Christianity, yes. Do you think if modern science were true, it would destroy Christianity? Like it, it, it couldn't survive anymore? You couldn't any... Uh, I don't know. There, the only parts that, that what you presented that destroys Christianity is uh, the origin of man and the how old the earth and universe are. Mm -hmm. The other things uh, don't destroy it, like you, you talked about the neuroscience and the soul. Those are not, there's no, there's no claim that those are physical phenomena. And so science can neither refute nor mm -hmm. confirm that. Yeah, so I think the problem... So, so I think the thing okay. is that there, there's, in Christianity, there's the acceptance that there can be supernatural phenomena, such right. like the soul and a god. Those things, science can either, it's just, that's why they call it faith. Yeah, this, the soul is kind of a different conversation, um, and I don't think you gave very much information on it on here, so I think I'll focus more on the science of, let's say, the origins for now then. Uh, I think one of the problems just overall, though, with the soul is that it's not clearly defined, and so that would be something we would do to go forward on that. I agree with that. So let's say, for example, so, so you believe that there is a scientific consensus, it's just that it's incorrect. That's exactly right. right. Um, I mentioned this null hypothesis. Would you agree with me that the null hypothesis for the origin of humans is that we, humans descended from um, other animals? Uh, I don't know enough about your definition of the null hypothesis. Uh, I think, what, from what I understand, you're defining the null hypothesis as just a being true by default. Is that what you're saying? Well, okay, the way I would explain the, the null hypothesis is basically the current hypothesis. So, for example, in the flat earth days, that would have been the null hypothesis. And so if you have another hypothesis, then you do tests and try to experiment. And if it falsifies the null hypothesis, then this becomes a new hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And so I'm saying, I think in modern science, we have a null hypothesis for the or origination of humans, and that is that we descended from other animals. That is a null hypothesis, and if somebody says, oh, we, I think we are instead created by God by a miracle, that is a challenging hypothesis, and then you have to look at evidence to support that. And if you do support that, if there is evidence that's sufficient to support that, then the null hypothesis is basically done away with. Well, I think you have things backwards. The first hypothesis was that God created everything, and then the second hypothesis was the evolution. And there has yet to have been proof that there's enough evidence to support that new hypothesis, evolution. So, so I'm talking about the scientific establishment, though. I mean, I think, don't we agree that um, there's, there's scientific consensus that humans descended from other animals through evolution? Well, yes, but, I, but my premise is that that scientific consensus is not well-founded, and I think right. we just made a good case for it. Right, so you don't agree with it as a null hypothesis, but that is the null hypothesis. That is the, the scientific consensus, right? So, it's, it's the scientific right. consensus, right. but uh, you can't... If, see, I think you're trying to uh, equate a null hypothesis as being true, as, as being a well-established fact. No. Now, no, I'm just trying to say the null hypothesis is the current one under scientific well, investigation. It's, it's, or the it's the default, basically, for it's the a, yes, current science. Yes, it's the default, but it's, uh, it's a false default. And that's because you believe there's another hypothesis that has better evidence for it, and it has disproven the null hypothesis. That's what you're putting forward. No, I'm not putting that forward. Because the, the God has no evidence. It's based on faith. What I'm saying is that there's no evidence for what you claim is science. See, science has to meet criteria. It has to be empirically measured. It has to be logically determined. But if God does work in the world, there's gonna, it's going to leave a mark. If God did create humans from scratch, there would be ways to test for that. And See, that's where we differ. Okay. See, God had miracles. Miracles, by definition, are supernatural, meaning outside of nature which means there can't be any physical phenomenon, means there, is, there cannot be any physical phenomenon that can leave over. Well, uh, an, See, an, obvious, well an, obvious, an obvious counterpoint there is if you were a cripple, we all knew it, and if you had a miracle and you're cured, we all know that. So it's, it's, if God invades time and space, it's going to leave a mark, and so that's the evidence for it. It leaves marks occasionally, but not always. Well, a worldwide flood, for example, would leave tremendous marks all over the Earth. Not and so a supernatural correction. Why... why because if everything was everything's underwater for over a year, that would leave a lot of marks. Uh, no, well, here's the oh. thing. You're, you're, you're inflict, this is the beef I have, is that uh, atheists often inflict natural criteria on supernatural phenomena. They don't separate the two. If you can have it now, you admit that we believe that the flood was supernaturally created. 
and it can you can't have a flood. A flood can't be done under the natural laws of the world. Well, I'm just saying if it happened, though, it would leave all kinds of marks. Well, so regardless right. of how it happened, if there was such a worldwide flood... Well, the, the, biblically, the flood was created by a supernatural phenomenon, by God. Mm -hmm. And if he can create a flood supernaturally, he can certainly do the correction of it supernaturally. And oh, so let me, but now you're, submit, you're saying that might, he might cover his tracks. If, if everything yeah, was underwater for over a year, that would be a lot of marks for that. But he might cover his tracks, erase it, so track. people would have to believe by faith. Yes, bingo. If you can have a supernatural So, but that would make God a deceiver, though, because now he's, uh, he's, he's covering up and trying to make the world look differently than it really should be. No, he's just correcting, no. the, he's just correcting the punishment. He's undoing the punishment. Okay. So, <laughs> looks like we went over a little five minutes, so. That's okay. okay. <laughs> I don't have many corrections. Um, I just have one question. Is, uh, what evidence is there that millions of years can create complexity out of nothing? Do you have any empirical examples? How do we know millions of years can accomplish so much? Well, okay, so well, it's not like nothing and then you have complexity with evolution. Uh, okay, evolution starts in the big picture of evolution. There's more than just biological evolution. There's also cosmological evolution. And then, so cosmological evolution would explain even the formation of basic chemicals. Uh, you know, at first there's helium or hydrogen. I can't remember which one. And then stars are formed and they create other chemicals and they blow up in the supernova and they create matter and then on matter we have life that arises and then even with evolution there's another kind of evolution called mimetic evolution which is, explains how thought processes and cultures and societies and everything built on thought processes evolve well so. let me restrict the question um, what evidence is there that um, you can get on earth you can get life from inanimate well, I was, at first I was confused. We had five minutes each, I think, right? So I, I think I was supposed to drive it for five minutes. So he should have a little bit more time, I think, just to... Okay, we'll extend it. To okay. So, say again. So, uh, what evidence is there that you can get life on Earth mm -hmm. from inanimate chemicals? Yeah, so that's one of the mysteries uh, so far that scientists are trying to discover is how life arose. It's, okay, and it's, it's kind a of... a step further. Yeah. How, what evidence is there that millions of years can make a human out of a single-celled animal? Yeah, so again, humans didn't evolve out of a single cell animal. I mean, humans came from other animals. Like Richard Dawkins says, you know, if you, if you look at a child, it looks like its parent, but over millions of years, it, you see the big snapshots. And so if you go back 186 million, who's his daddy, who's his daddy, who's his daddy, 186 million late, uh, generations later, it looks like a fish. Well, what's you the know? evidence that that can happen? I think a really good evidence is when you look at the DNA and genomics and you can see how the bits kind of change. And that's the thing where if God did make things uniquely, it's like he's a deceiver God because like, you know, to put a bunch of broken genes in us that looks like we inherited them, I mean, that's just, that's a deception thing if we didn't evolve, if we didn't come from other animals. How can you say that uh, we have a common ancestor with the ape, for example, when we can't mate with the ape? Well, there's the evidence shows that only species that can mate with each other have a common ancestor. Well, that was an interesting question I had with you. Well, okay, there's a, okay. So basically, I mean, scientists would say we are apes also. Um, there's there's these common ancestors. We don't even we don't know what the common ancestors are because the fossil record isn't complete. Like every year, we don't get a fossil record. There so. was a study at a Cornell University Medical School published in 1977 where they mix the sperm of humans with the eggs of mm -hmm. like eight different mammals, including mm -hmm. baboons, monkeys, and several other things. And there could be no combination of the two. Mm -hmm. How do you explain that? How could there be a common ancestor? No. How could there be mm -hmm. a common ancestor if you can't even have in vitro fertilization? Well, yeah, I mean, they're, they're just too, too much different to combine. I mean, See, I mean it's, like, it's like a human and a fish. Of course, they couldn't mate either, but we, right. we came from some kind of fish-like creature. And that came from other things, too. So. See, that's, that's the thing. There's empiric evidence, and there's the speculation of evolution. The empiric evidence says that only creatures that can mate can have a common ancestor. Yet, evolutionists somehow disregard that evidence. Well, how about like a toy poodle? How about, I was thinking like, how about a toy poodle on a Great Dane? Can those mate? In, in vitro. In vitro, and then... You can have in vitro. But a toy poodle, but a toy poodle couldn't give birth to it, probably, because it might be too big, uh, they, I would imagine. That's true, but they are still the same. They can mate with each other. They have the physical capability of mating 
You can do in vitro, you can put the poodle genes in Okay, the but in the wild, though, they couldn't mate, though. How do you know? A Great Dane and a Toy Poodle? They, they're both the same species. They could, you can do in vitro. Now, the, the only difference is their external genitalia. Yeah, right. And, uh, but their, the sperm and eggs could combine. Yeah, I was just thinking, and physically trying to get that to work. Is, no, is they, they could work. not. And so that, that's, why, that's why they're the same species. What I'm talking about, for example, fish have external fertilization. Yet they don't, yet in ra only rare cases, for example, you can't have a cross between a salmon and a trout, even though their sperm and eggs can co-mingle. Uh, so we know from empiric evidence, the only species that can mate could have a common ancestor. Evolutionists just reject those facts and make these wild speculations based on nothing. That's my problem. That's why I can't call it a, a real science. All right, I'm afraid our time is up for this okay. session. It's quite an interesting conversation. Um, Kind of sad to see it stop, but we'll continue on with the audience Q&A in a little bit. But first, I have a single question for each of our presenters, and I think I will start with Mr. Daler. You each have five minutes to answer your question, by the way. Okay. Um, so, starting with you, the... Hit go. Oh, oh, okay, never mind. Okay. Um, the title of your presentation is, Does Science Destroy Christianity? And my question I'm wondering is, would you view the destruction of Christianity as a good thing, why or why not? Um, yeah, overall good. Uh, what is good and bad? Good means basically, I mean, that, that's a philosophical question too about morality. I think good means that uh, it maximizes pleasure, it's better for the environment, it's better for education, and it's, you know, it's a long line of truth. Uh, things that are bad are things that hurt in the long run. So, sure, in the long run, I think it's good to be in the truth, and I think evolution, Christianity is an ancient religion built on an ancient science, so how can that be good to um, somehow lift that up? Now, there are things in religion that are good that atheists can also use, and I'm a humanist minister, so I like to you know, encourage those also. For example, you know, encouraging people to love each other, being considerate, being uh, respectful, you know, teaching moralities, even though it may be a different basis for morality. So there's a, there's a lot of good things in religion also that we can still use without having the theology that doesn't make sense. I mean, like the theology, for example, that we're all born sinners, there was an Adam and Eve that caused it all, and now we're under God's wrath because of this, you know, that stuff. I think it would be good to see it go away. Yeah. So, I mean, go ahead and challenge me. I mean, if it... Okay. Is there You've any, still got four minutes. Okay, but so. see if you can challenge me a little bit. Like, I mean... <laughs> that was too easy. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean... How could you play more of a devil's advocate, I guess? So I'm admitting there's good things in religion, and you know, but overall I think a Christian theology, yeah, it'd be a good thing for it to go. So you would like to see a world where Christianity did not exist, and by implication, one might assume yeah. other major religions. Yeah, see, that's, that's kind of interesting, too, because see, Christians think that Jesus is going to return today or tomorrow, maybe next year, maybe the next 10 years or 20 years. It's called this imminent return of Christ, and I'd say it's one of the most famous failed prophecies ever because they believe that in Jesus' day, too, or the, the first of disciples, and it didn't happen. But we can live on this uh, planet, actually, for, million, for a few more million years, and so we really got to take care of this. Right now, humans are causing another mass extinction event. So if, so if Christians really believe that Jesus is going to come next year, or 10 years from now, or 100 years from now, why bother trying to preserve the world for another few million years? So that's another positive outcome of losing the religion on that standpoint. That's it? Okay. You're all done? Yeah. All right. So... I have to admit I had a hard time coming up with an uh, appropriate question for you, Dr. Rex. I uh, well, don't really know you that well and could probably pluck a few different things from your presentation today. Um, well, let's see. Where should we start? How about uh, let's talk about evolution a little bit because we went into that a little bit in your uh, cross-examination session. Uh, and you mentioned in your presentation uh, the fossil record, but only briefly. And you said your explanation for the fossil record, and please correct me if I'm wrong in any particular part of this, that there were organisms that lived a long time ago that are now extinct. And that's the simple, straightforward, to the point explanation for the fossils that exist. That's right. And the thing is that 
given what I personally know about fossil record is that they do illustrate macro evolution. And that, say, like we mentioned cetaceans earlier, whales, um, we have the fossil evidence, most of which is found uh, in regions like Pakistan, interestingly enough, because that used to be underwater. Um, and the pieces fit, all the, all the puzzle pieces fit, both uh, morphologically and geographically, and they appear to be much, much older than what I understand your belief of the age of the Earth to be. Would, would you uh, be so kind as to tell us how old the Earth is? Uh, historical record says roughly 8 to 10,000 years. 8 to 10,000 years. Depending so, on how long Jesus' ancestors lived. So we, we could probably ask several That's good questions by historical from, from this information alone. So given that we have the morphological and geographical and um, phylogenetic evidence for macroevolution through reproductive isolation, which is uh, something that we hinted at but didn't really go into explicitly earlier, how does that fit with your explanation of life as we know it today? Well, your question's a little bit vague. You have to get, give me a specific example of evidence. I don't give what do you mean? more specific. Phylogenetic, morphologic, I don't know what you mean. <clears throat> morphologic is the physical characteristics, say with the bone structures, if we're looking at fossil records. Mm -hmm. uh, phylogenetic has to do with um, genetics, the genetic history, mm -hmm. how all those pieces fit together, like we were talking about earlier. Yes. So all of these things come together, and they do. This is the evidence that does illustrate macroevolution and common ancestry for all living things. Well, see, that's a little fallacy. You, you, didn't, you didn't grasp my concept of the fallacy of the firm and consequent. You're putting the, using the consequent to affirm your, pre, your uh, premise. Uh, if evolution were true, then you would have the fossil record and the phylogenetic information. But because we have that information, doesn't make evolution true. It's an illogical conclusion. Uh, my explanation for everything you've mentioned is that life, there's a common, there are common laws to uh, biology such that uh, phenotype matches genotype. The more similar species look, the more similar their genes would be, and vice versa. Uh, structure follows function. If something needs to swim, it has fins. Uh, embryologically, um, for there are certain stages animals need to go through embryologically in order to form certain structures, such as the neural tube. In order to get from the spine to from the cell, uh, certain cells, you have to have fold. You have to form sheets, and then they fold, and then they form these neural tubes. And that's why there's some similarity of structures because all life obeys the same rules. Um, there's a structure that follows function. Uh, there's uh, laws of uh, uh, laws of uh, uh, physical chemistry that everything behaves. And because there are laws of physical chemistry and laws of biology, everything is going to follow the same rules. You wouldn't have, oh, positive forces reject, uh, rejecting other positive forces. We're all carbon-based. That seems to accommodate life. Why would a giraffe be silicon-based? Uh, because carbon-based works. Structure follows function, and there's laws of physical chemistry that we all obey. That's my more simple explanation. There's nothing about everything, anything you mentioned that, that uh, says anything about relationship. We have older fossils and newer fossils, but how do you know they're related? They're different. Empirical evidence shows that only similar things are, have a common ancestor, are related. You, you're rejecting empirical evidence by saying that these are different. Therefore, they're, how can you say they're related? Based on what? As far as the fossil record, uh, you show Actually, I got a little, we're talking about fossil. I have a picture of skulls that probably many of you see. Those skulls there from the Smithsonian Institute showing chimp is number A and man is uh, lower right. And the implication is that there's a gradual evolution of, uh, of an ancient primate, which is B, up to modern man, which is N. Now, to me, when I look at that, it looks like only M and N are human. L and everything before that has uh, slightly smaller skulls and a much longer upper jaw. The difference in skull size between L and M looks pretty good. Now, empirical evidence says that 
in order to give birth or eventually give rise to uh, a larger skull, we call that hydrocephalus. It's a disease condition. There are no incident incidents, there's no empiric evidence that a creature with a smaller skull could eventually give rise to a creature with a larger skull. That's not shown. All we have are these static, this is what I call my uh, comparative biology studies. We have these static pieces of information, and only in the evolutionist mind do they tie them together. There's no evidence of the tying together. There's no evidence that fossil B is the ancestor of fossil N. That's all we have. That's not science. What empiric evidence is there that N, that B, is the ancestor of M? How do we know we can get, how do we know that the, they eventually could evolve? That's my response. Very good, thank you. All right, and now we will open up. <laughs> I see we have some very quick volunteers. So we'll open up our session to a audience Q&A. We have a full hour to do this, so there's no real reason to rush. Uh, in terms of ground rules for this session, I'd like to ask everyone to uh, please keep their questions pertinent to the presentation today as much as possible, but um, this is ultimately a, meant to be a learning experience for everyone here as much as possible. So if your question deviates a little bit, that's okay, but at the same time, please try to keep it in line with what we've presented here today. So I'll just pass the microphone around. Let me, let me add also, too, that when you ask a question, um, sometimes people ask a question and the people in the audience might think it's really a bad question. They might interrupt or go boo or something like that. So try to be respectful. Let the person make their viewpoint, you know, and then when you have time, you can follow up on that, too. So just try to be respectful to the person answering the question. Let them say it in peace without judging them. And also, please keep in mind that, um, as Bernie mentioned earlier, uh, he does not represent the entire atheist community nor does Bart represent the entire world. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. In, in, a, humble, in a humble way. <laughs> okay. Bring it on. Let's begin. Yes. I guess my question is for uh, Dr. Rett. Oh, Rett's Yes. yes. Um, there were a lot of pointing out of the holes in the theories of evolution and in the fossil record. Um, geologic evidence. Anytime we didn't have hope,
people in the United States know the person who's going to be in the car. But then what? Does it blow up if it's not broken? The spear and it's the broken How do we know? Okay, uh, okay those are just broken spears. Right. How do we know? All right, how do we know about the life of uh, George Washington? Historical evidence and and the visual. We have, you know, both his letters, his signatures, we have testimony from. So testimony and written documentation. That's not all we have. Painting. All right. How do we know about the life of Julius Caesar? Again, same thing. What? Written documentation. And residual evidence. Residual evidence of what? That doesn't tell us about Julius Caesar. He could have just been a fictitious creature. My point is that we rely on written documentation. Written documentation is the convention for knowing about history. It's supported by artifacts like spears. It's supported by artifacts by spears and uh, structures. But it doesn't tell you the details. We don't know. There's no science that tells us uh, that uh, when the fall of the Roman Empire was. We know by written documentation. We know that it fell. You probably see your busted up monuments. But the main, the conventional way of knowing history is by written documentation. People, historians write it down and they pass it on. That's how we know the details. So that's how I, that's why I believe the Bible, because it's written documentation, just like you believe the written documentation of the life of Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great. So we both believe in written documentation. Go on, you have a count. I have, I sense the little eye rolling. Go ahead. There we go. Um, the, no one really contests the existence of those figures, and, and no one really contests, and no one's really championed them as supernatural, as anything above natural. Um, whereas the Christianity, they do. They're saying that these people were existent, not only existent, um, but they had some supernatural beyond the level of any kind of evidence. That brings to my next point. Something from above creating what comes out, comes down here, but which 
Uh, just a quick comment on this too. You're in it. Okay, and then let's try to be crisp and clear with you know a, a, a new speaker too. So instead of trying to pile on, let's try to get these questions separately. I just wanted to bring up a couple of points real briefly. One is again I'm introducing this word consilience. This is means, for example, do we have why do you believe in George Washington? There could be documents. That's one thing. Another thing might be evidence, like um, maybe there's artifacts. So there's, there's different ways to analyze a hypothesis from different angles, and we want to look at all those different angles. And again, we use induction, deduction, and abduction to figure that out. Um, Bart said something about uh, scientists don't believe in the supernatural, almost like because they don't want to. But I would say the reason why we don't, why as an atheist I don't believe in the supernatural is because there's no good evidence for it. And also he brought up that, well, it just seems impossible that, you know, how do you do this, how do you do that? Therefore, it's probably likely maybe God did something. I want to admit, yes, you know, you can see some videos about how microbiology works, the micro machines in the cell. It's mind. So you're trying to say, well, see, this is. I'm not trying to say. Okay. Well, well, there's actually a, there's actually kind of a. Material scientists have been pushing it into the, into the, into the ground and hiding it, and just because it doesn't, it doesn't match up. It's a completely new science, and it's real, it's provable. I mean, it's just ignored, greatly ignored. Well, there is kind of a new thought religion that says you can make things happen by how you think. Um, yeah, that's, like, so much. that's like the new age, like, catch on it, you know, that they, they want to manifest things in their life for this mass mm-hmm. and they can, using, using that theory, is, that's, that's ridiculous. That's, mm-hmm. that's a, a spin-off of, of, of probably quantum theory or something like okay. that. The people have been trying to manifest things in their lives metaphysically for 30 years and not so long. Did you want to just say anything, Bart? No, I wanted to move on. Okay. So, uh, the, okay. We'll get back to you if you have a follow-on question, if you want to go more. Sorry, I'm going to go home, actually. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. My question is for Dr. Rask. Um, I was curious about the ancestors having common genotypes and, um, and our skeletal systems, whales, birds, humans. We all have the same skeletal systems. How can you explain that we simultaneously evolved the same way? That's I'm not saying we evolved. I mean, why do we all have skeletal systems? Yeah, why do we all have the same skeletal systems, the same common genotypes, but there's no common, you're saying there's no common ancestors to those? I'm saying we have no common sense ancestry with whales because that's what empirical evidence shows. Empirical evidence shows that males and men can't meet. Empirical evidence shows that only creatures that can mate have common ancestors. Even though they're so far apart, we're not, I'm not suggesting that they should mate together or anything just because they mm-hmm. have common ancestors. So, now, you, you forget that science needs evidence. What is the evidence that they, they do have common ancestors? 
just because they have, I, I've given you my reason that they don't. What is your reason that just because they have, they both have femur bones, that they have a common ancestor? They have a common ancestor. Well, what explains that they have the femur bone by themselves? Uh, God created them. And uh, what makes evolution a plausible answer? What makes evolution uh, not as supernatural as my answer? What it, what is it? What is the evidence that, that tells you that men and whales have a common ancestor? Well, I can't I told you why they don't. I told you, what is the evidence for it? The fossils, the genotypes, yep. the common, you know, DNA well, that we, we have. Know. And you're saying that God created all of the same yes. DNA, the same fossil structures, the same right. body structures as everything else. But that is just a clear cut because, opposed to the fossil record, and you're well, saying that that's not. Well, neither does God. Bingo. So we both have the faith. What you say has no evidence, and what I say has no evidence. <laughs> now, here's the thing. You've been trained since you were young that the fossil oh, record... No, I have not. Okay, well, anyway, I'll, I'll, okay. There's this um, presumption that the fossil record, similarity means uh, common ancestry. Well, that's not... That doesn't mean... That's, that's the fallacy of affirming the consequent. You have to study the fallacy of affirming the consequent. We know that if evolution occurred, there would be similar structures of creatures. That's what you're saying. Similar structures of creatures does not mean evolution occurred. There has to be some evidence. There's no evidence of random mutation in natural selection. How do we know that they, did, they each creature wasn't, how do we know evolution wasn't a subsequent recreation of each creature by supernatural forces? How do we know that random mutation in natural selection was involved? How do you know? I told you why that they're not related, because of empirical evidence. What's the empirical evidence that these older fossils and newer ones are related by natural random mutation natural selection? What's the evidence? All you're saying is by what they look like. The DNA, our DNA is different from whale DNA, but we know that we don't have a common ancestor. We know that we, since, and we know that we can't, we know, empiric evidence shows that only creatures that can mate have a common ancestor. You're rejecting that empiric evidence. Well, look, so a follow-up comment? Sure. Okay, and then maybe this might help spark, I don't know. So, okay, so one idea is that, he, that animals evolved from other animals, and that's how we got all our animals today. The other hypothesis is that God made special creations. There is no descent. So you're saying the, the alternative is the correct hypothesis where God made animals unique. So every species is unique. They did not descend, correct? No, there's some, there's some microevolution. If, right. if they can mate with each other, they probably had a common ancestor. But you're saying from species to species. No, so here, that's, that's where we get, that's, remember I had my definition of physiologically different species. Mm -hmm. Like wolf and dog are taxonomically classified as different, but they okay. can mate. So, but for example, here's the, I don't want this to get into war of semantics. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of times you get into semantics war, uh, it, it clouds things up. So I'm not restricting it to what the taxonomists taxon taxonomist right. define as different species. But what I'm talking about is mating ability, physiologically different. Right, right, right. So, but, but yeah. So when you look at the, the many different creatures, like for example, a fish, a chimp, and a human, you're saying these are all different species. Yes. They're all made uniquely. By God. Yes, where there's some minor variations, right. such as dog breeds. So there's, so there's no common descent between humans and dogs and fish, for right. example. Right. right. Okay, so that's your alternative hypothesis you're coming up with. Now, right. so one thing I want to mention, though, is when you look at DNA, and this is what scientists are doing now with genomics, it's comparing DNA across different organisms. And one Christian biologist has actually shown this in his presentation. He shows the DNA, for example, for insulin. And you can look at it from all these different species, like humans, chimps, dogs, fish. And you can see how they change a little bit. Now, the, the way that a, a gene is, it's made by amino acids. And every amino acid is coated by three nucleotides, A, T, a, T C, G. These, there's more than one way to code it. So there's no like perfect way to code any kind of amino acid. But what we see is there is a certain coding. And when you compare these through the genomes, you can see there's some switches and changes. And some of them are, are the exact same copy. So some people might say, like, well, God just had a design and he used that for a copy. 
but what you can actually kind of see is you can just kind of see the changes. So this is what I'm saying. This is this is evidence of dissent. Yeah, the, I, yeah, your, your reasoning is low. I, so. you, need to, you need to read about the fallacy of affirming the consequent. You're using this evidence as using these observations as evidence for your theory. Um, and but they don't they don't confirm it because there's no evidence of random there's no evidence of a connection by random mutation natural selection. Well, all that shows is that uh, there are the, there's laws of physical chemistry such that uh, muscle has to have a certain structure. Yeah. We all have muscle, so we all have the same we all have similar DNA to code for muscle. We all have bone, so we all have the same DNA to code for bone. That's really all you conclude. There's nothing about an ancestral relationship in any of those observations. Well, what I'm saying is there are a lot of different ways to alternately code, and we don't see those. So, for example, here's an example, an analogy. Let's say, for example, uh, 10 different groups of people are going to go from Oregon to New York. And let's say, for example, somebody says, hey, these people did it all independently. So somebody says, let's look at the exact routes they took. And if you see some people going up through Oregon and, and, and staying on the exact same highways, and then they branch off in certain areas, you can say, I know these people, because there's so many different paths to get there, and because they all went one path, we know for sure they all copied that same path. And then you can see it break off here. We know for sure that's where they took different paths. So we can tell, even though they said they didn't copy, we know they copied. And so this is what I'm saying with the DNA. There's so many alternate paths that could have been done for amino acids, well, but because of the commonality, it's obvious. Yeah, because, so. well, what about the differences, though? And the difference is, uh, they, they example, look reasonable, how you, too, how you, how you see explain, them change. How do you explain mm -hmm. uh, the inability of uh, the sperm and egg of different species to not meet? Because, it, yeah, they're just too different. They have to have a certain similarity in order to be viable. That's right. But so how, do you, how do you evolve that? Well, the, the intermediate creatures are gone now. So the how-to, there are a lot of mysteries in the house. Is that, uh, yeah. In sexually reproducing species, the opposite species would prevent too much deviation of one, the opposite sex would prevent too much deviation of uh, one sex. For example, as the, there's something called the acrosome reaction that sperm and egg do. They have receptors, so which are unique for each species, the receptors of, uh, 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 human sperm can only match the receptors of human uh, of female eggs. They're unique for each species with some minor variation. Um, the male sperm receptors evolve a little bit. The female ones, that would become unselected because it's less a less favorable sperm, and so that would become extinct. Any deviation from male and female sperm receptors would result in that new mutant becoming deselected. So the opposite uh, uh, gamete would prevent too much deviation of the other one. And so in sexually reproducing creatures, it's, it's conceivably impossible to have any evolution because of the restrictions put upon the other gamete. Outside of my scope, I'm not here to talk about religions. Sorry, I'm not. That's for a different speaker on a different day. Well, I'll, I'll make a kind of comment. Sure. Uh, see, to me, it's all the same. I mean, like I said, it's it's all philosophy. We're trying to determine truth, and it's all about induction and deduction. So, you know, Joseph, uh, Joseph there's one hypothesis that Joseph Smith is the founder of the church, and he's got the true religion. Somebody else says, I have the true religion, and we can look at the facts of the world. And usually, like a Christian might say, well, or a, like a Baptist or, or a Protestant or a Catholic could say, like, well, Mormonism is obviously wrong. Look at the evidence. Look at, you know, just look at the evidence in the Book of Mormon, what they teach and all this stuff, and it's not conducive with reality. But the, the criticism is that, well, people don't apply that to their own faith. They ought to take what this so-called outsider's test where even put yourself outside your own faith and judge it just like you would another faith because it's easy for sometimes religious people to, to say the other one's illogical but they don't apply that to their own. Right. You know, the there, though, is that he's saying that it's... You have to wait till your question.
question. I really want that to go. Yeah, I'm actually a Christian theologian, so I teach comparative religions at the University of Portland. So I want to just reframe the conversation a little bit. I find it very interesting, but um, I, I agree that that where uh, science meets theology is in philosophy, and that's where they can converse with one another. And um, one thing that I've been thinking a lot about is you as a humanist minister, Bernie, um, you, you are approaching life as you said good is the maximization of pleasure. How do you um, get to that definition of good based on Darwinian theory? Because your, your philosophy mm -hmm. is based on Darwinian theory, right? Mm -hmm. The survival of the fittest. How would you care for the poor? How would you speak to issues like gentrification? Uh, how would you um, deal with with those who are marginalized uh, through an understanding of survival of the fittest? Yeah, you have a lot of different comments there. I mean, one thing I wanted to correct you too, you said science meets the religion and the philosophy, but it depends on the religion because, for example, Barth's idea is that the earth is young, the universe is young, I believe he thinks the universe and the earth are about the same age, so when you have that, there, that's, a, that's a hypothesis that I think could be tested. So it's not just philosophy, that's a scientific question. I don't know about you, whether you reject evolution or not. I mean, I would guess you probably also reject evolution. So that's a scientific issue. It's not just philosophy, I would say. Now you're... Sure, yeah. I would say, um, Christian theology is very so mm -hmm. I, I teach other religions, but theologically speaking, um, even when the centurion sees Jesus on the cross, he does not see God. He sees Jesus as a man. So there's still, a, and when he cr cries out, behold the Son of God, that's still an element of faith that's happening embedded within history. So for me, uh, I, cannot, I cannot speak to science um, through theology. And I think this question of science, does, does science destroy Christianity, is somewhat an unfair question because it polarizes the two to begin with. Well, let me, let me ask you, though. Do you think, from a Christian theology, theological standpoint, do you think all humans descended from Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve were the first humans. I think the, the Bible speaks theologically. And so I would interpret it theologically. And I think God speaks in baby talk in a lot of ways in Genesis 1 through 3. So in that, he's he's not he's not writing. It's not a scientific textbook. So to try to pigeonhole it as one or the other is to try to make it a scientific thing. Yeah, but I'm saying, but theology flows from that scientific viewpoint. So can you answer whether you believe there is a first human, such a thing as a first human biological human? I I'm open to dialoguing with science, and that's why I think this deception mm. just goes back and forth because you both have good arguments, and it could go either mm. way. I just don't think that's the question. That well, see, this this is the crisis in evangelical theology, and this is the reason why I left is because those who say yes, I'm 100 percent with science and biology, there is no atom, and that impacts big time on what they call her hermeneutics with how you interpret the Bible and theology. Some people say, well, I don't know, maybe so, maybe not. If it's maybe, then there's no consequences. How could there be consequences to a maybe? But once you understand, yes, that's what modern science says, yes, I believe it, you, you're forced to rework your theology. So theology is not pure, you know, have, it's not like theology has nothing to do with science. Yeah, I, I mean, and I, I think that a theological interpretation of that leaves open to accept either view. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the point of the Genesis account is that there is a fall, that there is something bad that happens within our world that now is impacting it. And all the things that right. you listed, so you, okay. horrible things, there is evil in our world. And and I think that's what that book explains, that that's happened. I don't think it tries to explain science. Um, and so to mm, but that's a, those against okay. one another, I think that, that doesn't create a well, if you, like, again, if you say there is a first human, then you have pitted yourself against science. So you can't say you shouldn't pit science against theology when you're doing it yourself. No, but I didn't say that. But, I said okay. I, I'm open to, 
I, I think science so there may or may not have been a few well, first I think, human. Yeah, I think, mm -hmm. I think there may or may not have been. Science, okay. but science is, is able to make observations and say things, but okay. they can't really speak to theologically, did, was Jesus hanging on the cross of God? Okay, but I thought I heard you say that all humans inherited original sin from Adam and Eve, and maybe there was a fall event, literally. No, I think there was. I think there was sin. There is a, 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 there is a reality of sin in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't think the, the Bible tries to explain how that happened. Okay. So those who believe in Adam and Eve usually believe there is a but paradise maybe state. Maybe you okay. Question. Okay. The, the question on secular humanism and right, given, theory, how do you, yeah, how so, do you define good? So given theory? evolution that basically we came about through um, survival of the fittest, how does that relate to love? Why should we, we be loving? If, so basically, I would say survival of the fittest is a evolutionary process that created us, that got us where we are. Where we are is with complex brains, and we can contemplate things and discuss things about morality, what is good and what is bad. So I believe there's one philosophical system. It's called divine command theory. That means God said it. I believe it. I don't think. I don't judge for myself what's right or wrong. The Bible says it. It doesn't have to make sense. God said it. That's called divine command theory. Another theory, which I, that there's a moral system which I go to, and it's, it's strongly consequentialism or utilitarianism. And basically it looks at the outcomes. Here's a situation. What would probably be the outcome of that? Is it beneficial or more harmful to society? And you look at it from a third-person perspective. You don't say, is rape good or bad? Oh, I feel like raping, maybe it's good. You look at it from a third-person perspective. If people raped each other, what kind of society would we have? You can see it would bring more pain overall, so it's a bad thing. So we maximize you know, the good and try to minimize the pain. So basically, I would say evolution brought us to these complex brains where we can now think about this and say, what's the best way to live? So. All right, next question. Well, maybe Bart, if Bart you want to give Bart a chance to, if he ever wants to do a counterpoint? Yeah, I, 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 I don't want to get into theology. Okay. Go right ahead. Uh, question. Well, the doctor. Um, you talked about, you based your belief that the Earth is 10,000 years old and you use the movement was not expansion concept, but Edwin Hubble, I think, pretty much proved it to almost every scientist that the universe is expanding. And they based that on the reverse theory that it came from a single point. So how can you stand with the 10,000-year-old Earth concept? And by the way, that's, scientists believe the Earth is 4 billion years old, not a few million when you were talking about development. Uh, we didn't come from the primordial slime in a few million years. It was billions of years. So what, what's your answer about Edmund Hubble's? Edmund, I, um, I don't... That screen right there. Moving doesn't mean you're expanding. No, no, no. He measured it with red shift. They, they know it. it was, I, I, well, I don't know. I, as colors change as it moves away. See, there I have a problem in, their, in what the interpretation of what they're actually measuring. Well, this, you're just rejecting it without really knowing what the... Well, so I can't comment about it then. 99% of cosmologists accept Edwin Hubble's uh, theory that, there are, that the uh, universe is expanding from a single... Send me, the, send me the study. I'd like to see it. Um, universally, though, in studies like that, there's a fallacy. In what they, it's usually based on they believe the Big Bang Theory to be true. First, they believe it to be true. And they make these assumptions based on this hypothesis, like up there. And and um, so I can't, since I can't, here's the, here's the problem. People cite these studies, and they make claims based on these studies. And then I haven't read that one, so I plead ignorance. But universally, there's been um, uh, faulty conclusions based on it. I have not found an exception. But I'll be happy, since I don't know that study, I would have to, you would have to send it to me so I can give you an intelligent answer, so I can pick it apart. My, remember, I've been a, a reviewer for Medical Journal for 14 years. I know how to pick things apart, let me, let which, me make which, a, is what I, which is what I've done. Let me make a brief comment. Maybe it'll jog your memory or something, too. The way I understand it, there's the red shift uh, when you analyze light from distance galaxies, and that indicates that they're moving away from us. And there's a blue shift, too, that means it's coming towards us. And so, and they've actually measured the expansion of space because of this, and they not only see that the space is expanding, but it's expanding at an accelerating rate. And so, like you said, they say, okay, well, if it's expanding, 
then let's work it backwards, and that's why we have a big bang. So this red shift that's called the Doppler effect in with light. So does that jog your memory or not? So, it, so, it me so it measures things that are moving away and moving toward you? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so how long a distance? How long can it measure things for? It's in the 30, so it can set these a lot here. No, no, for, it, it measures things, but for how, how many miles, how many light years? They've gone out to what they conceive as the edge of the universe, 14, 13.7 billion years. See, I, I, I don't know how they know that. They know how far light travels in a year. They've measured it. Well, no, I realize off. that. They, they bounce lasers off the moon. They can measure the time it takes, so they know right. the, the speed of light is, is constant. Speed of light is constant, but how do they know? I just don't understand the connection between years and movement. Well, you take a measurement in 1937 or so when Edwin Hubble started doing this, and they take measurements now, and, they, and there's an obvious difference in the, the light shift of, uh, of various stars. Sure, and what does that mean? Well, I'm not a scientist. I can't tell you that. Yeah, see that's, you see, yeah, see, that's the thing. That's the devil's in the details. They make the they measure make these measurements. So it's like what I talked about the W map, mm -hmm. uh, the locus of ma microwave anisotropy. Mm -hmm. It measures temperature of microwave radiation. But how they got get from temperature to years, the, it just doesn't make sense. You, you, a year is the time it takes for the Earth to go around the sun. How do they know? How do they how do they calibrate? It? How do they? I just don't understand. Yes, they have these. They measured these distances. But how does that translate into years? Do you know the answer? No. Well, see, the devil's in the details. See, they make these claims. They make these measurements. But how they translate these measurements to years is usually, from what I've, I've only read about the W map. From what I read about the W map, it's based on a complete fallacy. It's based on, first you assume that the Big Bang occurred, and everything is based on that assumption. Mm -hmm. They assume that because celestial bodies are moving, that they're expanding. And, but there's no, but they could just be moved. How, how do you know that they're just not contracting and only in one small area of the universe? I just can't believe that they're able to measure the entire universe. I just reject that. They map the entire universe. I, I don't reject, I don't. Well, I, I the, well the, you possible. mean the microwave background they've mapped? Yeah. This, they this, map what they know. Now see, this is something, this they is something I, I think is interesting too, is that, see, you're getting down to science where NASA says this and you're saying that's wrong. And I think that's an interesting, um, it's, a, it's an interesting place to be. I mean, some people say debates are worthless because nobody's going to learn anything. But see, for example, this is something me and you could go offline and talk about and learn more about, mm -hmm. and we could possibly convince each other. And yeah. there's implications on theology and everything else on this. Uh, see, you, you, bring, you bring up a classic problem. There's these studies that are done. People make these claims. And then they make these speculations based on these claims. And, but they don't really justify the speculations. And so I would appreciate if you send me what you know about that, and so I could pick it apart if, it's, if, it's, if I can do it. Okay, well. well <laughs> okay, but anyway. So I, I plead ignorance on that. But um, anyway, next question. Next question. I have a question. Chris, um, I'm just going to start off. I'm Barry's son, and I was raised Christian by him. And um, I agree with both of you. accept your uh, deconstruction of evolution and then how, by their own standards, they, they don't apply to it. It seems like they're just so rash and they're so willing to just be like, this is true. This is true. Christianity just, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It, it, it's like they're creating these, um, they create these solutions simply so that they can just hurry the end of Christianity, and it, I, I'm not Christian, and I'm not atheist, I'm agnostic, and uh, I can't accept a God as an answer, um, because um, as you were saying, it's an illogical fallacy for, for evolution, uh, they, their, their theories are based on logical fallacies, and um, I, I get the, uh, that concept of it's a supernatural phenomenon, so these concepts do not apply, and I guess what my question is, is um, that you're, you're wrong in a way that rather than 
than simply saying evolution is true that you don't know and that the scientists don't know. I think the, I would say the evidence supports a naturalistic worldview, and especially with evolution, I say it's all about evolution. So I mean, when you look at the fossil record, and especially since the year 2000, the DNA record with the science of genomics, where they're actually comparing DNA across species. So there's two hypotheses. One is that God created these things individually, like chimps, humans, giraffes, as Bart says, or the other hypothesis is that they descended from each other. And so when you look at the evidence, I think it screams really loud that there's dissent going on here. So if God did create things uniquely, I think that's a deceiving God because he made it look like there was dissent when there wasn't. I used to believe that things were created uniquely. So it's not a matter of me just wanting to believe. I mean, as a, a Christian, I went through the whole route. I used to be a young, young earther, then an old earther, then an evolutionary creationist. And I thought, okay, now the world just makes sense through naturalistic eyes. So that's why I think there's evidence for that, but there's no evidence for... God, basically. Can I please say something? Um, there's a confusion between uh, the commonality among species and equating that with common descent versus just equating that with all life obeys the same laws of biology. Uh, and that, see, what I, in my other slide, I showed the simplest answer to explain observations. Evolutionists, they think it's evolution. But I say, well, no, that's not, because that assumes random mutation, natural selection, and relationship, which is not shown. My simpler explanation for commonality is that all life obeys the same rules of biology. We're all carbon-based. We're all carbon-based. There's the physical laws of chemistry that we all must obey, and that's why we all, that's why there's a commonality among species. Things that swim need fins, and so on. And there's a jump in logic that you make from the commonality among species, from my more simpler explanation, which requires fewer assumptions, to relationship. And I just, I just want to be just curious, Bernie, looking at that slide there. Is there something here you don't agree with? Well, I just want to say right off the bat, though, um, about the pseudogenes. I mean, there are a lot of, we have thousands of, even for, thousands of pseudogenes, even for the olfactory sense, the sense of smelling. So, um, and they're obviously busted genes, and so it, I, there's no, through, through descent, that's easily answered why we have broken genes, but if God made us uniquely. So I could look at this. Um, what about that conclusion? Uh, now, see, but what makes your conclusion of common descent a scientific conclusion? Well, see, this is another thing interesting about pseudogenes, the busted genes, and so Dennis Vinema talked about this. He's a Christian, ev evangelical Christian who also believes in evolution, and he's trying to show his evangelical brothers, like, look, evolution is true. So he, was, he denied evolution too, but when he was studying for his PhD, he wrote his paper on pseudogenes. And just as you would expect, there's a branch, let's say, for example, according to evolution, there's a branch here. Well, both these people, both these creatures on this branch have the same busted gene. Then when you look at that branch, there's another busted gene that's introduced that only those from those descendants have and the other ones don't have. Then there's more busted genes that the descendants have. So you can see the busted genes in order of descent. So, it, so otherwise, I mean, it just doesn't make sense that God made these things yeah, unique. Right. I found a couple papers out of the journal Science and the other one out of the Annual Review of Genetics. The studies that show that these mm -hmm. pseudogenes are actually probably regulatory genes. They regulate genes adjacent to them. Mm -hmm. So they are finding functions for them. Right. And you, you assume that since we don't know the function for all of them, they must be busted genes. And that's not a logical conclusion. See, what happens is they think... Let me just okay. inject. Now, to say evolution is scientific, it must meet these rigid criteria. It just can't be assumed true based on default. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my premise. There has right. to be positive data to make it right. scientific. And all you're giving me is these default explanations. There's no other explanation for pseudogenes, therefore there must be uh, a common descent. And that's a default. It's not a positive thing. It's not a positive statement that, m that meets the criteria as a scientific theory. Well, like I said, too, like, so there's two theories. One is that God made everything by miracle or that humans descended from other animals. So when you look at the evidence, you'd say, like, what is most parsimonious with that? And like I said, if there's, when you look at the descent tree and you see how they're, in, they're the way they, they look, it looks like there's inheritance. There's no other, I mean, it's kind of obvious. It's kind of uh, an induction, like, or just 
was most parsimonious. You know, it fits the it fits the data better. It's hard to explain why it would look like there's a scent if things were created uniquely from scratch. So you admit then there's no really positive evidence. You're just concluding it because it, the, the, the God uh, creationism is less powerful. No, actually, I think there's a whole bunch of evidence, and there's different lines of evidence. That's, that comes back to that word of consilience, where there's different ways of looking at it, like DNA. Looking at the DNA code is one thing. Looking at fossils is a totally different way of looking at it. There's, uh, there's other ways to look at it, too. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. Okay. We have two minutes left in this room, okay. so I think oh. we're going to have to... Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mark. Okay, thanks, Mark.